So welcome. Uh, I'm Dave Merman. I'm a board member in the Green Mountain Care Board. And I'm, this is great turnout. Thanks so much for everyone coming tonight. Uh, Susan Barrett just said hello. Where did she go? I don't see her. There she is in the back. She's the executive director of the Care Board. Uh, Dr. Levine, I think, is supposed to join us tonight, Commissioner of, a, uh, Commissioner of Department of Health. And, uh, and I don't know if we have anybody from the legislature here tonight. Oh, and Brendan, I'm sorry. Yep, and, and uh, Brendan's new uh, healthcare reform director at AHS. And someone pointed to somebody. Oh, great, thanks. Great. Um, so first, welcome. Thanks for everyone coming. Uh, and I'm just going to go through some housekeeping stuff real quick. So out in the hallway, there's some refreshments. Uh, there's two exits. There's one here and one there. And it looks like you can go either way to get out in case of an emergency. Uh, the only bathroom that I discovered was by the front door. Uh, but there's a bathroom there. There is closed captioning. Uh, and so if anybody would like some help getting set up with closed captioning, it probably if you just let us know, we can get you set up. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, I think we have Orca Media here this evening. Uh, there will be floating mics. There's this one, and hopefully there's another, but we'll do when it's af after about, uh, after uh, Dr. Hamry's presentation, we'll have a Q&A for a good period of time. And so just raise your hand, try to keep comments you know, relatively brief, questions relatively brief, but we'll bring around mics for people. And uh, the program is scheduled for about an hour and a half, but we tend to go late if there's questions. So if you're willing to stay, we're willing to listen for, for beyond that. And uh, maybe you'll do introductions afterwards. It's OK, just a second. I'll do a few more things. OK. All right, so tonight you're going to hear from Dr. Hamry um, about his team's work on analyzing healthcare in Vermont, including findings on how we might uh, sustain an affordable essential healthcare services in Vermont's communities. Dr. Hamry is an infectious disease doctor who helped with state with his COVID modeling during the pandemic. He's the former chief medical officer of Geisinger Health System, which is a large health system in Pennsylvania that's known for high quality, low cost, very effective multi-hospital system. Um, and he's been consulting with hospitals with Oliver Wyman for now for over a decade. And I think he might retire after this project, but we'll see. I, I don't know. He loves it. so. Um, before he shares his findings, I just want to put a, a few things into context uh, about healthcare in Vermont. Um, in Vermont, we have a lot of challenges with affordability, sustainability, and access to care. For years, uh, with regard to affordability, for years we've been hearing from Vermonters about difficulties paying for health insurance, paying out-of-pocket costs. Um, we've had skyrocketing insurance rates for the last few years, double-digit. Currently, as submitted, the requests for the QHP plans are are double digit. Patients are rising with these premiums, uh, grappling with these rising premiums, but also out of pocket costs, which have been going up as many insurance plan, as healthcare cost goes up, health insurers try to put some of that cost back on to patients through co pays and deductibles as opposed to premium, and those have been rising as well. With regards to access, um, it's somewhat regional, but in certain regions of the state, access to primary care has been very, very challenging. Access to specialty care uh, throughout most of the state has been fairly challenging. Uh, mental health treatment, I think, is access in my experience. I'm an ER doc. I work over at CVMC. So my experience with mental health treatment access, it's, it's improving, but still challenging. Um, access to nursing home care right now is very challenging. Uh, and long-term care, inpatient emergency room wait times, which unfortunately my patients experience, and uh, boarding in the ER to get uh, a room in a hospital is often uh, occurring. Uh, from a sustainability standpoint, um, our community providers have been struggling with uh, reimbursement rates that aren't keeping up with inflation. Uh, the recruiting and retaining staff, especially for the community providers, has been challenging. We have a lot of primary care providers who are aging out and retiring, and there's not a new crop of people to come in and take their places. <clears throat> and our hospitals, 
uh, have definitely been struggling with the financial challenges right now. Nine out of the 14 hospitals last year had negative operating margins, so that the revenue they take in from the care they deliver is less than the cost of the care they're delivering. Um, this is really troubling because the Green Mountain Care Board has approved fairly high rate increases over the last couple of years, but yet still hospitals are having these negative margins. And the goal with those rates is just to keep access to care available for the communities. Um, and this is sort of where it all comes together. So when the Green Mountain Care Board, you know, when we approve high rates for hospitals to charge higher prices, that gets passed on to insurers, which gets passed on to rate payers, taxpayers, and so thus the financial challenges of the, of the system. Um, we, just to keep going the laundry list, we have, we have an aging population which puts into place some very challenging, and, and Dr. Hammer's gonna talk in detail about this, but some challenging um, dynamics where people are aging out of commercial insurance into Medicare, and uh, Medicare does not pay as much for care as commercial insurance, so the pool of commercial insured people is shrinking, the pool of Medicare patients is expanding, and so the overall average reimbursement is going down, and the overall need of our population is going up. We're not alone. Most of, much of the country is seeing these issues. Rural hospitals throughout the country have seen challenges. There's been lots of hospital closures. We haven't won, had one in Vermont in a very long time. Um, and that's the goal, is to sustain having the services that community needs uh, in the community. So uh, part this, that's sort of the whole setup of why um, through um, the legislative uh, initiative to for Act 167 to allocate funding for us to hire Dr. Hamry and his team. Uh, we have taken, you know, the, the, the state has taken on the task and asked Dr. Hamry to take on the task of trying to figure out how to, um, how to look at the sustainability and access and affordability of our healthcare system in Vermont. So I'm gonna pass this off to Brendan who can give a few remarks from AHS and Thanks, Dr. Berman. Um, hi, I'll keep my remarks very uh, brief because there's a lot of material to get through. Um, my name is Brendan Krauss, and I am um, 12 days into my new job as Director of Healthcare Reform, recently appointed by the Governor. Um, we uh, obviously share the perspective that Dr. Merman um, and Dr. Hambry will share tonight, uh, just to, um, and you know, are here to listen to the community, and we like to thank you all for coming. We like to thank uh, the Green Mountain Care Board and our colleagues for the work that they've done to assemble both this, uh, these presentations, but also um, to arrange these meetings so we can hear from you. Um, just to let you know sort of what happens next, so this is a partnership with the Care Board um, that will continue. Uh, right now, this is the first phase, so we're getting this information that the team, Oliver Wyman, has compiled um, that we'll be sharing with the communities around Vermont, and then we'll be receiving your input and your thoughts about those uh, recommendations. Then we will go back uh, and take uh, that those comments this information and analyze what the potential local impacts would be from various solutions so we can begin to prioritize those and come back to the, to the legislature and the board and the community. Sort of start making some decisions about um, what makes the most, what makes the most sense for individual communities. Um, I guess that means I should stop. So <laughs> <laughs> thank Dr. Hamry and hand it over to him. Yeah, thank you. I think thank the you. end was going to go. Oh, I'm sorry, I always yeah. forget that part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes, exactly. that's a year. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll use my outside voice. Uh, so my name is Dan Bennett. I'm the CEO here at Gifford. And I just want to say thank you to uh, everyone for being here tonight. Because ultimately, this is about uh, our community and what services are available. Uh, here in our community. So it really does uh, impact everyone, and I appreciate uh, those uh, those of you who live here and work here uh, and receive services here in our community for being here and participating tonight. Um, I'm and speaking on uh, behalf of our Gifford team. I want to let you know that we are engaged uh, in this uh, Act 167 uh, process. We've had multiple meetings with Dr. Hamry and his uh, Oliver Wyman team over the past year, and I do want to just note uh, and uh, make a note of our appreciation for their willingness to listen to our comments and concerns as we've gone through the process 
Um, so uh, I do want to thank them uh, for that. Uh, our team is also participating with the Agency of Human Services on uh, their work now to convene people from around the state and start coming up with solutions and start enacting those as we move forward. And our different team is going to continue uh, to seek ways to make care more accessible and more affordable for our community. Um, and it's going to take a combination of creativity uh, and um, uh, creativity and innovation as we move forward uh, to make sure that Vermont's health care system is sound. Um, and uh, I'm happy to, to note that Gifford has long been a leader in enacting innovative approaches to ensuring uh, that we can provide care to our communities. Uh, one um, main point of note, we're one of only two organizations, healthcare organizations in the country. Thank you. Does that work? Uh, we're one of only two healthcare organizations in the United States that pairs a federally qualified health center and a critical access hospital. Um, and what this does, this allows us to access millions of dollars in federal funds every year to support local health care services. Uh, this means we've been able to expand outpatient mental health services. We've been able to continue to provide primary care services in communities where we might not uh, be able to otherwise. Uh, it's allowed us to partner with other uh, nonprofit health care organizations in our community to provide access to dental care, uh, transportation, uh, and food, and also uh, to, to mental health services outside of Gifford. Uh, so we will continue to seek ways to adapt to meet the future needs of our communities uh, while we work with our colleagues at the Agency of Human Services and our local partners to come up with uh, sound solutions moving forward. So with that, I'd like to hand the mic <laughs> back to Dr. Hammer. Hopefully this works better. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. Oh, golly. Can you hear me? Okay. Help, uh, electronics are great when they work, but when they don't. Okay. Well, good evening. Thank you very, very much for coming. I hope you brought umbrellas. It's supposed to rain when we're finished. So uh, we've been having this problem follow us for the last uh, three weeks. So I apologize for that. So we're here tonight to report back to you on our efforts to fulfill the mandates in Act 167. These are to conduct a data-driven patient-focused, community-inclusive effort to assist Vermont's hospitals to reduce inefficiencies, lower or constrain cost growth, improve population outcomes, reduce health inequities, and increase access to essential health services. This project rapidly expanded to involve the entire health system in Vermont because as we'll talk about, hospitals do not control who comes to them, and they have very little control over where people go. And so the result is that things pile up in the hospital, it can't work as efficiently as it would like, and they're not necessarily able to take care of everybody who comes because they're full. So we'll talk about that in more detail. You've just heard from uh, the representatives from the Green Mountain Care Board and the Vermont Agency of Human Services. Our Oliver Wyman team is here to present and answer your questions along with the other people and groups present. My name is Bruce Hamery. I am a physician with over 50 years of experience in practicing and teaching medicine, hospital and health system administration, and healthcare consulting. My colleague in this effort is Ms. Elizabeth Sutherland, a partner in the term of, uh, firm of West Monroe, and she is an expert in health inequities, and she's led that part of this effort. Unfortunately, not able to be with us tonight. We've been ably assisted by Ms. Irene Way, our engagement manager, who's in the back of the room, and Ms., by Ms. Danielle Etzel, uh, our senior consultant, who also is not able to be here. 
my team and I began this journey to examine the health system in hospitals in Vermont 11 months ago in August of 2023. We have spoken with and listened to over 2,000 Vermonters from all 14 hospital service areas across the state. In this journey, we've also been greatly assisted by the, Green, by the staff of the Green Mountain Care Board, Ms. Marissa Melamed and Ms. Hillary Watson and many others. We've also been helped by many leaders and staff throughout the Agency of Human Services and by Mr. Mike Fisher and his staff at the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Mr. Mike Del Trucco and his staff at the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems has also been especially helpful. Another consulting firm, Mathematica, and a team led by Dr. Arkadipta Ghosh has performed many of the data analyses we have used to develop the options for changes in care delivery. These options have been presented to each hospital and its board. Those options were then amended based on our conversations with the hospital and its board. So why are we here today? We want to accomplish four things. First, to report what you and other Vermonters have told us about your lived experience with health care. Second, to explain the problems facing your hospital, your community, and the state as a whole. Most of these, as I said, are beyond the control of the hospital. We will show you what some of the impacts of these various pressures might be on your community and on the Vermont health system writ large. Third, we want to share at a high level what some of the options are that could be used to address both the current and future needs that uh, we project. These will apply to most hospital communities, but not necessarily here. Fourth, most importantly, we want to set the stage for your active participation as a citizen and as a community in this effort to transform health care in Vermont. As has been said, this process will be led by the Agency of Human Services, supported by the Green Mountain Care Board, and is the next step in fulfilling the mandate of Act 167. We're going to skip agenda. These quotes represent what some of you, your caregivers, and others in your community told us last fall. I can no longer afford the procedures or medications. My only option is not to take my medications. As a critical access hospital, we need to be critical access to people. Lack of provider continuity of care and a lot of provider turnover is a big concern. Lack of mental health services in this region is a big issue. I can't find specialists for my patients now. I cannot imagine what will happen if I didn't have our specialists at Gifford. At Gifford. There is a person I know who was in the ER recently. She was released and told to follow up with the PCP, a primary care physician, which she does not have. We have a new EMR system and have had multiples over the past years. However, no records available when going to an appointment. I know this is being addressed. So, um, so these are comments from others around the state. And I just call your attention to many individuals don't go to care because the premiums and out of pockets are too high. Um, I, Gender affirming and reproductive health access is an issue. Getting patients home has been a challenge, uh, and so forth. So uh, common themes. Note here that housing and transportation uh, are listed and have appeared in almost all, uh, all virtually every community that we've uh, uh, gone to. So these problems include housing, affordability, cost, access to mental health, gender affirming care, and transportation. So let's set the background for your current experience. All Vermont communities are facing significant challenges in healthcare access, 
equity, and affordability. The access and equity challenges are shown on the left. The affordability challenges on the right. Note the difficulties in getting timely appointments for doctors and for surgery. It's not been uncommon to hear people having to spend six to 18 months to find a primary care doctor or three to six months or more to get an appointment. It's also not, we've also heard that people have waited 12 months for eye surgery, as an example. Uh, now, these problems are not everywhere. We have talked to some doctors and some FQHCs who say, I can see one of my patients in three days. Uh, those are uncommon. Uh, we did do a study, my group and I, with the uh, uh, Green Mountain Care Board and the Office of Financial Regulation on access about two years ago. Those numbers were very similar, and uh, they clearly got worse during COVID. Uh, may be getting a little better now, but are still major challenges. Transportation is an issue, an issue getting people to the doctor when they can get an appointment and afford it and home, to the hospital, and if they're in the ED when they're discharged, home, and from one hospital to another in a timely way. On the affordability front, uh, as Dr. Merman noted, there have been major increases in both health insurance premiums and out-of-pocket expenses, making the use of health care out of financial reach, even for many with good insurance. Major changes are needed to reduce these rates of increase. Vermont hospitals and many others in the U.S. are facing significant operational and financial challenges. These include the, the inability to recruit staff, whether this is due to a national shortage of physicians, nurses, or other healthcare professionals, or to a lack of affordable housing in Vermont when they can be identified. And I've heard stories from uh, many hospital folk and others around the state that, yes, we could sign up a doctor or a nurse. They came, they spent three months in a hotel, they couldn't find a house, they went somewhere else. So housing is a problem not only for Vermonters <clears throat> who lack a home or who are not housed in a place with light and heat and so forth, but it's also a problem when you try to recruit people into the state, whether those are healthcare people or um, people to do other work. A major issue affecting small communities is the number of doctors in a specialty that must be recruited to provide an acceptable call schedule. Now, call schedule is how many nights in a week are you responsible for going to the hospital emergency room or answering the phone or whatever. Uh, Forty years ago, that was one night and two. Ten years ago, it was one night and three. Currently, it's one night and four or five. And so that means if you want a cardiologist or a neurologist or a general surgeon, it is very hard to find one. Nobody's willing to be on call every night like my granddad was. Okay? So now you need to find a way to support four or five, which means you need to share with another hospital, which is being done. But you also need enough people in the community to have enough of the cardiology problems to be able to economically support a cardiologist. So it's also a population-driven thing. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So this, this is a difficulty across the US, all the small hospitals and a lot of the larger ones. Additionally, many hospitals are old and need to replace their air conditioning, heating units, elevators, or so forth. And as Dr. Merman noted, they've not been able to make that money from their patient uh, revenues. Some surgeries done at hospitals are done too infrequently for the staff to maintain an adequate proficiency. Many of these require not only expertise on the part of the surgeon, but also from the anesthesiologist, 
the operating room staff, and sometimes support from an ICU or certain specialists. Supporting these teams with the staff and equipment necessary will likely require hospitals to combine some surgical and medical specialists in ways that support regional access without requiring people to travel to UVM or Dartmouth or Albany or Springfield or Boston or New York. Many hospital resources are also consumed by people who do not need the services of an acute care hospital. These individuals may be waiting for transfer to a mental health facility or chronic care facility. They may need a place to live or the services of a home health agency to be able to be discharged from the hospital or the emergency department. The hospital is not paid for these patients as their care is, quote, no longer medically necessary. They also occupy beds and nursing time that could be used for other patients who do require care in an acute care setting. So these are, this is one of the reasons the emergency room may be crowded and backed up. It's one of the reasons that the hospital may be able to take care of you, but they're full, so you need to be transferred. On the financial side, the costs of the people who work in hospitals and the drugs and supplies needed to care for patients are increasing at rates faster than the rates the hospital is paid. There have also been four uh, reasonably unanticipated changes in federal policies within the past six weeks that will add to the increase of the cost of health care or reduce access. And I would say I doubt any of these are in the current budget submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board because they were, they were announced after the budgets were, uh, were completed. One is an imposition of a tariff on all medical products produced in China. This will go from 0% this year to 7.5% last year or next year to 25% in 2026. So this affects gloves and devices and bandages and all that sort of thing. I would note that one of the presidential candidates has proposed a tariff on everything made outside the U.S. Much of our drugs come from India and much of our medical equipment, radiology equipment comes from Germany and France. So. Second, there is a requirement for increased uh, RN staffing in skilled nursing facilities. This is a good thing, needs to be done. But nurses are in short supply, so it'll clearly increase uh, the, or make the recruitment, recruitment more difficult and increase wages, which is probably, wage increase, not a bad thing, but uh, will increase the cost of the hospital. Third, cut in Medicare payments to doctors of 3.5% will go into effect next year. And so to any hospital that employs doctors is going to see a decrease in that revenue. Fourth, um, the feds took a meat cleaver to uh, payments to home health agencies, and that will be cut by 7.5%. Now, Congress uh, got upset fairly with the profit that the for-profit home health care agencies were making. But they took a meat cleaver. They said 7.5% across the board. They did not exempt the not-for-profit home health care agencies that you have in Vermont. So that will also add to Dan's trouble uh, in trying to get people home with home nurses. And therefore, it's going to you know, keep some of those things that may not be needed to be done in the hospital there. As Dr. Merman noted, in fiscal year 2023, nine of the 14 hospitals had negative operating margins. An operating margin is like the balance in your checking account. It reflects the income from patient services minus the expense of providing those services. If you include the two additional Vermont hospitals in the red in fiscal year 2022, 
11 of the 14 hospitals in the state have had negative operating margins in the last two years. This makes borrowing money expensive and difficult for the hospital and the financial sustainability of the hospital problematic. I must note that all people in the hospitals, the directors, their staff, the nurses, everybody, are taking measures to address this. So this is, a, the people are doing a lot of work to keep this from happening. Not-for-profit Vermont health plans are also not making money. <clears throat> and I'll show you that in a minute. They are tightly regulated and their premium increases are driven by the costs of care paid to providers, hospitals, drug companies, and others. They are also required to maintain certain levels of reserves to ensure their ability to pay for the care you require. And these reserves are reaching levels that are alarmingly low. Every commercially insurer's Vermonter's cost for health care has increased markedly over the past six years. On the left, between 2018 and 2022, the median increase in household income for Vermonters was 22 percent. These costs increased even more for those employers that provide health insurance for their employees. In the middle panel, the Green Mountain Care Board approved hospital requested increases in charges of, 28, of 38 percent. And on the right, the cost of a silver plan on the state exchange, the Blue Cross plan, for a 40-year-old person, the benchmark for comparison, increased 108 percent. At one time, as you see to the lower left of that graph, it was uh, just about even with Massachusetts. It was $474. Massachusetts was 456. It's now twice as high as Massachusetts. So steps must be taken, plans must be made, and implemented to change these rates of increase. So how, have, how has my team uh, approached these issues? Well, uh, I'm a doctor, we do what doctors do. We um, used interviews and data to make a diagnosis. We used tools and data to make a prognosis, a forecast of what the future might look like given certain assumptions, and we'll get to those in a minute. And we developed and identified treatment options. Some were drastic, and all may require substantial changes. <clears throat> You as a community are the patient, and together with the hospital board and leadership, you get to make the choice of treatment together with other communities and other hospitals, the Agency of Human Services, the Green Mountain Care Board, and others. We listen to you. To make the diagnosis, we listen to you and other communities. We took a history of your present and past illnesses, reviewed your symptoms, and so forth. The many people and groups we interviewed are shown here. These included not only hospital leaders and boards, but also the many healthcare professionals who serve these communities. These have included dentists, physical therapists, mental health counselors, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, EMTs, home health agencies, nursing home administrators, and many others. We have spoken with many state agencies and departments as well as legislators. We've also met with a number of community and state organizations advocating for those suffering from health inequity and those with special needs, whether those are mental health needs, physical needs, or with specific illnesses needing more specialized care. We have sought out groups with unique language, ethnic, and gender identity characteristics. We performed tests on your community. Mathematica did projections of total population uh, in your county. And I call your attention here to the top uh, blue sections of these uh, bars. 
uh, on the extreme left in 2020, the population uh, here was about 14,000 people. We anticipate that by 2040, that will have dropped about 2,000 down to around 12,000. So that's a 16% drop in total population. Now, Dan's told me you've got a new apartment building and folks are moving in, so hopefully that will help fix some of this. But this is a trend that's general throughout the state. The other thing I want you to note in those blue bars is the light blue are um, the elderly, age 65 to 74. And that population as a proportion is, uh, will increase from 15% to about 24%. The dark blue um, are what's called the advanced elderly. Uh, looking out there, I think I'm the only one in that group in this room. Oh, okay. well, don't volunteer it, you're a lady. <laughs> um, so that group is going to increase from about 7.6% currently to 12.6%. Now, look at the numbers. That takes this from a little under 23% total to 30 to 33.7%, which means one out of three people in this county in 10 to 15 years is going to be over 65. And um, those of us with a lot of gray hair know that changes what you need. You're not worrying as much about a sprained ankle. Uh, you're worrying more about other things, uh, memory care, assisted living, uh, you know, uh, broken bones from soft bones and that kind of stuff. So you want to think about this as you plan for a redesign of a health system for the future. The other thing I'd point out to you is that dark gray area. This represents working age people between 20 and 64 years of age these are the folks who are working. They can buy commercial insurance, which is used to offset the underpayments that Medicare and Medicaid give to hospitals. So typically, usual hospital, different in some parts of the state, Medicare and Medicaid make up 70 to 80 percent of the total patient and, and money coming into a hospital. In Vermont, it's often closer to 80% or a little over. The remaining is 15% or so of commercial insurance. Those are where the rates go up, and those dollars then try to keep the hospital afloat. So as Dr. Merman pointed out, what happens here is you lose people who are buying commercial insurance you have more people moving to Medicare, and therefore payments to the hospital drop. The other thing I would point out is that there has been, to date, a, a, a reasonably um, high increase in the number of Medicare-eligible people who have chosen to do a Medicare Advantage plan that becomes commercial insurance. And so a hospital that's a critical access hospital, which in part depends on Medicare paying it extra. So a critical access hospital gets 101% of its Medicare costs. Okay, so in that sense, more Medicare beneficiaries is okay. But if those Medicare beneficiaries convert to Medicare Advantage, and that's managed, the, those pay, that comes out of the base. So it's not a good thing. So the, the point is, this changes a lot of things over time. We did estimate from the population changes, numbers of cancers, heart disease, stroke, and that kind of thing shared those with Dan and his board uh, and with others. Okay. So we did a physical exam to look at your systems of care statewide. 
the least expensive places to receive care and prevent the need for more advanced and expensive types and sites of care are shown at the top. Self-care, community prevention, housing, group homes if people need them, adequate numbers of facilities for mental health treatment, substance use disorder, and so forth are needed. Enhanced capabilities and staff for primary care givers, mental health counselors, and substance use disorder control are also needed. As depicted, when these things are not available, people are forced to seek care in the emergency department sometimes with an advanced form of illness requiring hospitalization because they've waited too long for treatment. If the illness is too far advanced or the community hospital is full, they may require transfer to a larger, more distant medical center. The result is an inconvenience for the patient and her family together with a bigger bill. Using all this information and reports from prior state commissions and consultant reports, we then constructed a financial prognosis or forecast. This makes certain assumptions which we have tested with many people. Not everyone agrees with the exact numbers, and I will emphasize that. Shown on the left in the boxes are the increases in charges requested by Gifford Hospital and the rates approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. Over the five-year period 2018 to 2022, uh, the average was 4.1 percent requested and 4.1 percent approved. In 2023 and 24, uh, the average was about 3.6 percent requested and 3.65 percent approved. So you see on the, gr the gray bar in the middle, on the left of that is the previous performance of the hospital. We chose 2023 as a base year. Now you see two lines there. The higher line uh, Dan gave us as what, the, what they're using is an average, that 1.8 percent is an average of the previous five years. We took the performance in the base year, which we did for every hospital in the state. And what I want to call your attention to is that with both those projections in the out years, it goes negative. The reason ours goes perhaps more rapidly and highly negative is because we took a reimbursement rate, a payment rate of 3.5% per year. That's the current target set by the Green Mountain Care Board, and it represents the consumer price index. The, price of all the goods and services you buy, plus 1 percent. We then estimated or projected a um, increase in expense of 5 percent. Now, my own estimate for that was 7 to 8 percent. Another consulting firm put out a report last week that said they think the uh, increase will be 8 percent next year. We talked to a bunch of hospital folk. They said, well, we think we can control it at 5 percent. So we used 5 percent. And you see the result. This is the same for every hospital in this state. Okay, out of all 14, with a 3.5 percent increase in reimbursement, and a 5% increase in cost, it all goes south, as you'd expect, right? Okay. Well, not okay, but it's the way it is. All right, so this shows in broad stroke what the Green Mountain Care Board's done over the last 11 years. I want to call your attention first to the small numbers at the top of those blue bars. Those are in billions of dollars. So statewide in 2013, the hospitals requested in aggregate, all 14 of them, uh, $2.1 billion in um, uh, revenue. And that was approved. In 2024, they requested 
$3.6 billion in revenue, and um, that was all approved. That's a 74% increase. And to put that number in perspective, in 2022, the total of all dollars spent on everything regarding health care in the state was $6.4 billion. We're going to come back to those numbers in a little bit because one of the things you'll need to do as you think about the future is in a $6.4 billion budget, there's money to free up and use for something else. Okay, so the numbers at the bottom show the uh, a to amount of the total uh, billions that the Green Mountain Care Board approved. It's almost 100%. That does not say that every hospital, every time, got everything they asked for. They didn't, but when you look at billions, it's a lot. Okay, this shows the um, insurance losses. This shows underwriting losses for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont over the past six years. Underwriting losses are the amount they pay for your care that exceeds the income from the premiums you pay. These are a, they're a tightly regulated entity. The Green Mountain Care Board regulates them to keep their premium payments low, but to not have them close. So what this means when they lose this money is they draw down their reserves. They are required uh, by the Office of Financial Regulation and everybody else around the country to have a certain amount of money so that uh, when this happens, they can pay the bills. Uh, I was on the board of Mass Blue for a few years, and these are scary numbers. And I, if I were on this board, I'd be going nuts. So point is, the insurers don't have any more money than the hospitals. We'll get, get back to that point. Okay, so what do hospitals do when they are not making money? Well, you learn in hospital administration school, um, and consultants teach you, that you have basically three major things you can do. One is you can increase your prices. Now, you, don't, you can't negotiate with the feds, right? You take what Medicare gives you, you take what Medicaid gives you, and where you raise prices is either for the insured uh, or for the very few millionaires who come in and can pay cash. Uh, or you work hard, like everybody is doing, to reduce your costs. Now, problem is 65% or so of the costs of a hospital are its people. And so if you're a small hospital, you can't cut that, right? You have a doctor, a couple of nurses, med tech, or some, and so forth in the emergency room, and it doesn't matter whether you see five people or 50, you've got that same staff. If you're a big place like UVM and you got 40 beds in the emergency room, fine. If the volume drops, you can send some people home. But the smaller hospitals cannot do that. You can increase the volume of profitable services. Those are things like orthopedics and some sorts of surgery. Or in the really bad event, you, you stop doing things that don't make money pediatrics and obstetrics. And so what you see around the country is small hospitals having to give up those services because they just can't afford to support them and sometimes because the number of women of childbearing age in that community is too low to really keep an active unit going. If all that fails, you request financial relief from somebody. You try to get a grant. You uh, get tax support. Or you hope Elon Musk shows up with a couple of billion dollars for you. So I would just point out with those, those red bars and all that stuff, 
these levers have not been working in Vermont. And you're at the point where your commercial insurance premiums are very high. People can't afford them. And so some changes really have to be made. Okay, big point, Hosp as I said, hospitals can't do this by themselves because they don't control what's outside them. So you're going to need to do things differently, more innovatively. I'll share some things with you that are being done around the country. None of this is magic. But solving this challenge will require concerted, sustained effort over time. And that process is starting with the Green Mountain Care Board now. And this is going to require your undivided attention. And it's going to require you to work with the Green Mountain Care Board and your legislators to make sure that the decisions you and the board and Dan and others make get accomplished. OK. So we did make, I'll go back one, we did make a, a big effort to see if addressing the problems that keep being raised of people not needing to come to the emergency room or people not needing to come to the hospital because they, they should have gone to a primary care doc but they couldn't get there, or people who stay in the hospital too long because they don't have a place to go. If you fix those and you could have people who are currently leaving the community to go to another hospital for care that Dan and his staff could give you, what would that do? Would that make things better? And the answer is a little bit. It would improve the revenue. It has an associated cost. And so a number, I'll use a, a hospital, a number might go from in 2028 from negative 28 per, or negative 17 percent to negative 15 percent. Still too low, but a little bit better. Now, a major piece of that for us was trying to figure out what could be brought back to the communities from UVM and Dartmouth that the community can do. And as I said, the financial gain was small. So where do we go? As I said, hospitals can't solve these problems alone. Different and more innovative approaches are needed to reduce costs and improve health services in the community. What things are already underway that can be built upon or enhanced? What does charting a path forward look like? First, recognize the situation you are in and the adverse headwinds you're facing. And those adverse headwinds are ex the examples I gave of the four recent changes in policy. They're unpredictable. They sort of come out of the blue in some time, sometimes. Uh, and they're outside your control. So recognize that. The Marines would term that adapt. We've discussed the second, change what you can and build on current efforts underway to change the way healthcare is delivered in your community. The Marines would call this survive. Next, design and implement ways to improve access, equity, and to reduce the cost of health care for your community. The Marines would use the term overcome for this. Done in the right way, these changes can ensure the redesigned services have a stable financial and operational future. Abraham Lincoln said the most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. The new system you will design with others will need to address both your current needs and those of your community. Shown here is information from the most recent community health needs assessment uh, done by Gifford and you. 
and it identifies uh, on the right those medical and service needs that were prioritized, preventive health and access to health care services, mental health counseling and treatment, lifestyle disease prevention, smoking cessation, obesity and so forth, and dental care. So a lot of work on those, and that is shown in a little more detail here. Dan, I think, mentioned some of this. <clears throat> but I would call your attention to a couple things. One is a lot of coordination with other hospitals and health systems for shared oncology, pathology services, uh, biomedical engineering is the care of all the devices and equipment, the monitors and the respirators and so forth that a hospital has. Expensive to do, great to share it with somebody. Uh, an orthopedic surgeon who comes from Dartmouth uh, and the designated agencies for the state. A lot of work on uh, workforce development uh, and a family based uh, a, a family medicine residency program based at DFQHC. Uh, he noted the structure uh, that of the critical access hospital in the FQHC and working on transfer agreements to get people back from Dar that had to go to Dartmouth or UVM back to the hospital and the community. Um, a lot of uh, work on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, and particularly to the LGBTQ populations. A lot of work on social drivers of health and, you know, housing, transportation, food, and so forth. And we'll talk more about the importance of that in redesigning healthcare. Those are foundational issues. Uh, they have a value committee. Uh, working hard to improve outcomes. Um, and I would note high quality care is low cost care. So as you do that, the cost goes down. Uh, they have a mobile dental clinic. That's one of the examples I use in other parts of the state. Great thing. There are other mobile clinics that can be done as well. Okay. So changes at both a hospital and state level are required to meet both current and future needs for health care. These fall broadly into the five areas shown. One, embed updated and modern information technology in hospitals, offices, homes, and other places where people receive care. Provide housing for Vermonters and others moving into the state. As I noted, some in Vermont have no house, Others are living in houses without water, electricity, or heat. This is arguably the most urgent for need Vermont has, um, not only to address, address inequity, but also to provide a safe place for people to receive appropriate care outside the hospital. Adequate housing, whether a single dwelling, mixed income housing, group housing, or whatever, is required to reduce the crowding in hospital emergency rooms and the number of people staying in hospitals and mental health facilities because they have no place to go. So, you know, when I talk to the hospitals, they say, look, we have a lot of people in the emergency room. Some are here for weeks waiting to get to a mental health bed. And you talk to the people who have the mental health beds, and they say, well, we have a problem getting them to UVM for specialized care or wherever. And you talk to UVM, and they say, well, 20% uh, of the patients in my 60-bed psych units are there because I can't find an outpatient mental health person to see them and treat them. And so it backs everything up. And so a lot of this will get to what you decide to do in the community and how you decide to allocate some money. And that's just one example. Transportation, as I've noted, for people to and from medical care, pharmacies, and other places needs to be enhanced and available in the late afternoons, evenings, and on weekends to help people with urgent care needs get to and from the urgent care doctor's office or emergency department. 
Emergency medical services, which are largely staffed by volunteers, need to be combined, linked tightly to the hospitals, and made into a full-time professional workforce. This would create additional jobs in the community and allow the, patient, the provision of patient transport to and between facilities that could use vehicles other than a mobile ICU. Right now, every time a patient's transported, they go in a mobile ICU with an EMT and a paramedic, very expensive. If somebody's being transferred from a hospital back home or a hospital to a nursing home, they don't need that level of care. I'll tell you a scary story. When I was a medical student in 1968, I rode an ambulance in Texas, and in those days, the ambulances were run by the funeral homes. There were no EMTs, paramedics, or helicopters. And in effect, it was uh, not a hearse, but you know, it was gray, it wasn't black, but the patient could lay down, somebody could sit next to them, um, and give them oxygen or whatever, but that was, that was used to take people from their home to radiation therapy or from the hospital or whatever, and it's a lot cheaper than trying to do it with a mobile ICU. So, there are op again, there are options for ways to help transportation and other things. In the planning process to be described shortly, Hospitals and communities need to design a system in which there are regional referral centers, each containing an area of and a population of people that, have, uh, that are sufficient to support the physicians, staff, equipment, and other services needed to provide high quality, efficient care for specific diseases or conditions. Work we have done and shared with the hospitals suggests there is and will be sufficient need that some of these centers could be supported in a regional way within Vermont and allow people to travel shorter distances than going to UVM, Dartmouth, Albany, or Boston. In the system to be developed, all providers, including primary care, specialists, dentists, EMT services, hospitals, social care providers, and so forth, should have their payments linked to common goals, access, quality, efficiency, appropriate use of resources, and equity. Let me be clear about efficiency. This means doing the right thing at the right time, not forgetting to give a vaccine, and not ordering a more expensive test when another may be adequate and less expensive. As noted in the green below, the goal will be to provide the most appropriate and needed care in your home, in the community, or close by. There are many potential options for, for uh, Gifford and your community to work together and with other communities and hospitals to develop new programs and expand ex existing ones. And, uh, as I've noted, as uh, Dan commented, um, they're, they're doing a lot of this, right? Telehealth is currently used to support uh, patients with strokes, with neurologists, or heart problems with cardiology. One emergency room does psychiatry consults by telehealth so the patient, while they're waiting to go somewhere, can be treated with an appropriate medicine. Uh, telehealth can be used for monitoring people in their homes to see how their treatment's going. So I just call your attention to this. You can read your arterial oxygen level on this thing in real time. When I trained, you drew a needle, put a needle in an artery, drew the blood, sent it to a lab, and an hour later you knew what the arterial oxygen level was. You can do the same thing with an EKG. So many things that were not possible 10 years ago are now possible. Now, not for everybody, okay? You've got to have internet, you've got to have electricity. So if you live closer to town, you're more likely to have that than you are, like where my parents lived on top of a mountain in Tennessee, 18 miles from the nearest town, okay? 
But if you've got it, then those services are available to you, and that's a, a fair portion of the folk in Vermont. But again, it's going to need to be tailored to the situations of your community. We've talked about rural outreach and mobile vans. Uh, I've helped set up mobile mammography units, primary care clinics, screening for osteoporosis, um, work very well. Uh, the um, urgent care centers and primary care centers have worked to increase their evening and weekend hours, unfortunately, because of uh, people shortages, particularly nursing. A lot of them have had to pull that back. All these things are possible. Many are underway. Uh, we've got a list of um, 120 of these things. I'll mention one. Uh, you could put uh, a kiosk or a, uh, basically a, a vending machine in the emergency room if you don't have a pharmacy open at night that could dispense penicillin and blood pressure meds and that kind of stuff so that you don't have to wait to the next day or go 30 miles to a pharmacy. Uh, Montana, for example, is thinking about doing this with uh, Narcan and other uh, anti, um, you know, drug treatments because they're, they've got hundreds of miles where there's no pharmacy. Uh, the Philippines are doing this because they've got a thousand islands and 995 of them don't have pharmacies. So lots of possibilities, and that's what you and others will need to think about and, and work through. Okay, so how does this happen? This slide lists the major steps in designing the future of your community and hospital. The first step is to make a decision to change. I hope this presentation and our sharing of this information has convinced you of this need and of its urgency. In this process, you and many others will choose among the options we have presented and will construct some of your own. These options will then need to be examined for their impact on your community and their financial stability. Planning sessions and budgets to support the final options and plans will need to be made and the plans implemented. As I mentioned before, the Agency of Human Services supported by the Green Mountain Care Board will lead this process together the communities, providers, hospitals, and others desiring to plan the future to assist you in choosing among options for new and different mechanisms of care to help evaluate the effect of those on the community health and for their sustainability and then to implement the changes. Now, the Agency of Human Services and its many components have numerous services available and are at various levels of testing and implementing others. Many, but not all, are listed here. I, this is a slide I showed the Green Mountain Care Board, I think it was June 19th. That presentation and all this is on the website for you to go to and, and look at in more detail. And by the way, this presentation and all these slides are posted to the website now, and there's an attachment that you can make comments to. So if you don't get to make a question, ask a question or make a comment tonight, or you think about something later, please go to the website and make that. We monitor that, we look at it, and we're gonna take what you tell us tonight and those comments and, and use that to construct a final report and final set of uh, rep options and recommendations. So I'd call your attention, particularly to the right side, the number of things going on for the elderly and the number, the amount, number of things in supporting people who have mental health needs or substance use disorder needs. There are also a lot of uh, efforts going on to improve uh, information technology and medical data. Uh, this is critical when, when I see one of you as a patient or your doctor sees you. You've got to know what the 
tests are, what the, what the consultant recommended at wherever, uh, and what the plan is. Uh, they've also been working hard at the Department of Health and uh, the Office of the, the State Secretary to do a licensure uh, improvement so you can get more physicians and nurses and others uh, in, and there's a lot to do with that. Green Mountain Care Board's also been uh, working hard to, to help. Uh, they did several years back a task force on rural health services, uh, have asked hospitals about sustainability planning. They have improved rate increases, as I've shown, and recently have changed some of the certificate of need requirements. Okay, so where do each of you go next? How do you get involved in this process? You can attend community meetings and planning sessions like this one. You can monitor the websites of the Green Mountain Care Board and the relevant units of the Agency of Human Services for updates on this process and opportunities to comment and provide feedback on their plans and activities. You can support the administrators of Gifford and its board in making what may be difficult or painful choices. You can speak with your legislators and with the appropriate state agencies to express the need for making the laws and funding needed to put these changes in place. Change will not happen by itself. Designing and implementing an improved sustainable health delivery system will require the active participation and engagement of everyone in this room of other communities and hospitals, and of the state of Vermont. As shown by this photo of an Amish community raising a barn in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, working together, much can be accomplished. You have many more tools available to you than the farmers in this picture do. This is all hand work, hand saws, chisels, horses. Broad changes in custom and practice are also required across the state. What affects one community affects many others. An unplanned, unanticipated disaster in one community, whether a flood, a pandemic, or a hospital closing unexpectedly, has impacts throughout Vermont. As I discussed a short time ago, the financial projections for many hospitals in the state show diminishing financial stability over the next three to five years. I will note that if you add up all the millions that would be needed to bring hospitals in 2028 up from negative whatever up to zero, that's hundreds of millions of dollars, a lot of money. Therefore, your time horizon or runway for change and the, and the time to begin to implement the needed changes is short. The runway on the left is 10,000 feet, two miles. The runway on the right is on top of a mountain in Bhutan and is 900 feet long with a cliff at one end and an airplane hangar at the other. There are eight pilots in the world qualified to fly into that airport when it's clear and not cloudy. I've been there. I did not fly in, okay? Now, your runway is not 900 feet. It's more than that, okay? But it's not 10,000 feet. I live in a town, small town in uh, the mountains of Massachusetts. My town argued for five years about whether to bring fiber optic internet to town. You don't have five years for that discussion. So this process needs to start, needs to proceed along promptly, and something needs to be started within the next several years, okay? Because things around the state will get bad. And unfortunately, Vermont, along with Maine and West Virginia, are leading the charge towards the elderly, okay? 
And so you, uh, you're fortunate, I think, because you've got an active state government, legislators, you've got hospital folks that know what they're doing, and you are planning this process. You're not going to let it happen to you, I hope. Okay? So with that, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to turn it back over to Dan, but I'm going to give him a mic that works. Oh, no. You, can, you don't have to get horse. I'll try that. I'll try. Well, thank you, Dr. Hamry, and um, uh, for your presentation. And, um, uh, you know, I think uh, the problems that uh, we face uh, here are uh, in the healthcare here in Vermont are um, a, a symptom of the broader issues we have in the state, which you've done a, a good job here in highlighting. Uh, that includes lack of uh, working age population and an economy that doesn't support the needs we have throughout the state. Um, so we are working diligently on uh, the health care a part of that um, here at Gifford and I know our uh, colleagues around the state and working with the Agency of Human Services and the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, but we're not going to, we're not going to solve that uh, working alone. Uh, so I do call on our state and our private sector leaders to address these issues, the broader issues, with as much urgency as we are in the healthcare sector. Otherwise, our efforts to meet these goals, as laid out by Dr. Hamry for Act 167, our efforts are going to be minimal at best. So I thank you for uh, the opportunity to participate uh, and tonight and uh, onward. And I'm going to send it back to Dr. Hamry now to open for public comment. Thank you. So we had uh, comments are welcome in a minute. We had one a lady, a Melanie Gadney, sign up to give, make a comment. So please, and then we'll take others or questions. No screams of outrage. <laughs> no. Thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to make a public comment. My name is Melanie Gidney, and I'm the executive director of Clara Martin Center. Yeah. Uh, Clara Martin Center is one of 10 designated agencies um, that contracts with the state of Vermont to provide mental health and substance use services um, in the greater Orange County area. Um, one thing I just wanted to acknowledge Everything that was stated here about hospitals and physical health care um, also pertains to uh, the mental health system. Those same challenges with workforce, housing both for our staff and for the clients that we serve is a huge barrier. And a lack of housing, I think we all know, is kind of the foundation of that social determinants of health. If you don't have that foundation, your risk factors just go up extra <coughs> extraordinarily. Um, we have had, you know, I feel really blessed to have worked with Dan and his leadership team at Gifford, uh, with my leadership team at Clara Martin Center. We meet quarterly, both from a leadership perspective but also with the ER to work on the mental health issues and the backlog uh, that are happening in the ER. I think we all agree that's not the right place for people to get care with mental health or substance use needs. So I think we've made a great impact both locally, but also with the help of the system issues to, to break down some of those bottlenecks so the appropriate care is available. Um, I think in terms of the mental health system, we at Clara Martin Center, uh, we have struggled with uh, f stable funding for years. So one of the things that our Board of Trustees supported was us reaching out for a SAMHSA grant called the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. Uh, we were the first in the state to be awarded this funding in 2021, and <clears throat> that was right in the midst of COVID. And you know, I think we all know that substance use, mental health issues uh, have been increasing pre-COVID, but when COVID hit, exploited this issue uh, dramatically. So our increase in demand happened at the, continued increase in demand happened at the same time as the workforce challenges. And if you look at the number of licensed credentialed mental health uh, or substance use clinicians have significantly decreased uh, so the, the competition, the demand uh, to try to recruit and retain them uh, is huge. So I think for the designated agency system, uh, sustained long, uh, 
a long-term sustained funding plan is really key yeah. for that stability, just comparably to the, the physical health care world. Um, what I, uh, in terms of that grant, I'm really proud to report, uh, although I absolutely agree um, that there is not enough mental health resources in the state of Vermont, uh, through the grant and through some innovative work we've done, I think at Clara Martin Center, we had over a 100 person wait list, we're now down to zero, and we have open accessibility Monday and Thursdays here in Randolph. Um, that is not consistent across the mental health system, and I don't want to paint a rosy picture because it is a serious issue statewide. Um, but I think the, the innovation with AHS is um, working towards the state being a demonstration uh, state for the CCBHC and that opportunity to bring some additional funding into the state to stabilize the mental health and substance use needs. So I think I'm excited about that. Um, but I could equally say on behalf of the greater um, designated system, it is a system still in crisis. Um, I've appreciated um, the, the legislative support uh, because it did help stabilize um, a peak of a turnover for Clara Martin Center at 38% in one of those years to we're back to pre-pandemic levels of 18%. So that's allowed us to reduce that wait list um, and be um, <clears throat> open and accessible. Uh, to the residents of Orange County. And I think the final thing with the grant, and it really was to how do we reduce those barriers? Um, how do we break down those walls, whether it be transportation? If they can't get to us, can we go out and provide those services in the home um, or help bring them in through acquisition of a van uh, to bring people to us? So uh, that grant has been very helpful to help us break down some really serious challenges, um, but we're not out of the woods. And I feel like I'm one turnover of a position away, especially if, if a psychiatrist turned over, you know, my moment today significantly changes. So just reinforce everything um, that you reported on. Um, other systems are experiencing those same things, <clears throat> yet I'm really optimistic with working together with our community partners. Uh, there was a housing meeting uh, earlier this week here in Randolph. Uh, to a continued work with Gifford. Thank you. So, other uh, comments or suggest or uh, questions? I've put you to sleep. No, there's one person awake over there. Just teasing. Sorry. Thank you so much. My name is Vivian Franson. My husband and I are new residents of Braintree. That's about a seven-mile bike ride from uh, Gifford Medical Center. And I spoke with you back last fall, and I told you at that time that I felt it was impossible to get a primary care provider for my husband and myself. I have good news today, and that is that I now have a primary care physician, and I am in the Gifford system as my medical home. Yay! <laughs> on a waiting list for more than a year, but it happened, so blood tests are done, a long overdue mammogram has been done, dermatologist visits, including um, biopsies, which turned out benign, have been done. However, I had my first experience, uh, a referral to a specialist, and this is my primary care um, provider, uh, did what you need to do to, to get to Dartmouth Health, and last Friday, I got a letter, delighted as could be. Dear Ms. Franson, hello, our office received a referral for you to be seen in our department. If you'd like an appointment, please call this number between eight and five. We look forward to hearing from you. I got that on Friday afternoon. I couldn't wait till this Monday, two days ago, to call the office. And what I was told is that, oh yes, we do have the referral. It's from your primary care provider. And I was told that although there are 18 team members in ophthalmology department, all patients must first be seen by a certain doctor who is all booked up until June 2025. There is no wait list at Dartmouth. Um, so I guess the comment I want to make is that it may be really tempting for a lot of people to say, gee, if we don't have the service now, just send them to Dartmouth. And uh, that 
I think it's important to consider, I, I want to caution everyone to consider that what, what you see documented as medical alliances and policies and, pre and procedures don't tell the whole story. My PCP makes a referral to Dartmouth. Dartmouth acknowledges the referral received, but that doesn't mean the patient is taken care of. There are more hurdles to jump. My friends, the system is broken. Yeah. And when I'm, I push, as you might imagine, <laughs> just being told, oh, sorry, no wait list, and the, the doctor that needs to see you is all booked up till January 2025. Um, I said, well, gee, does that mean I go to Boston? And if so, how does that work? Yeah. And, um, and there was no response to that. Um, I, it turns out I'm gonna be okay because I heard a word of mouth suggestion that an ophthalmologist with an excellent reputation in Greenfield, Massachusetts, perhaps your neck of the woods, is taking new patients. Uh, but you know what, if this is a deta detached retina I have or um, age-related macular degeneration, which my 81-year sister has um, and is doing quite well because she got early intervention with injections every six weeks, um, that, that doesn't work to just not even next step, but just be told, oh, June 2025, we're all booked up and we're not taking appointments and you're kind of on your own. So that's the first um, comment I wanted to make. Second, I want to let you know that now that we have a primary care provider, I want anyone to know, please do whatever it takes to retain primary care providers at Gifford. If that means pay, benefits, professional education, so that Gifford can be a place where people grow, good working conditions, please make it irresistible for our current primary care providers to, uh, to stay in Vermont. And uh, the third thing I wanted to say is please con continue to allow pharmacies to provide COVID boosters. Thank God somebody made that decision a long time ago. I know that's probably a revenue stream that, that means Gifford Medical Center doesn't have, but probably it's a real pain since Vermont doesn't have the public health system that would take to, to give people COVID boosters. Um, I hope that continues to be. Thank you so much for listening to me. And again, it's a good news report. It's just, uh, sorry to hear about this whole referral to Dartmouth is not the yeah. answer to people's problems. Yeah, uh, true, uh, and elsewhere too. I, I will confess it's the same issue in Boston. Right, it's not a lot better. I've, I have a family member who's been waiting for um, eight months for mammogram. So uh, it is a problem all over. I, I do think there are opportunities for you here to deal with that. I, I would confess I'm a little surprised there's not a waiting list because people, you know, you don't know where you're going to be in June next year, right? And I, I ran through this. I ran a large health system. We had a clinic a group practice that had 1,500 people in it. And we looked at this ophthalmology thing, right? They kept the waiting list. And what happened was, at the end of every day, the secretary of the department would take all those pieces of paper and she'd put them in a drawer. She never looked at them again. Now, they had a, a no-show rate, a number of people who canceled on short or didn't show up. And we redid the scheduling. So we pulled those things out. There were 1,500 requests for ophthalmology. In, in a year and a half, 300 of those people had died. Now, they didn't die from eye problems, right? Heart attack, whatever. So, but what we figured out was that when you give somebody an appointment a year out, they're gonna call and change that appointment at least four times because you don't know where you're gonna be. So what we did was we said, we're not gonna give appointments further out than 60 days but when we remind you that you're due for your annual appointment, we will be able to schedule that within 60 days. And that worked. It also saved a lot of money because every time somebody called, it cost us five bucks for the staff and all that. And you only get paid 45 bucks for the visit, okay? 
So I'll have to walk over to Dartmouth and teach my friends some new practice, I guess. But, but I'm, I'm sorry to hear about the experience. It is, unfortunately, very common. Other questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. OK, I'm going to actually stand over here. It seems Be easier. Uh, so my name is Dina Wilkie. I'm here at the request of Representative Rebecca Holcomb. I am the community care coordinator for the Sharon Health Initiative. Oh. So that's a town nurse model, except I'm an occupational therapist. So uh, I think, as far as I know, I'm the only one doing this role that is a non-nurse. Um, so I just want to speak to the, the kind of tool we already have in place here that might be a good solution to some of the problems you presented today. Uh, which were very overwhelming. Right? Um, so our community care coordinators are, we're already in position providing the care that our clients want and need. Um, and not just our clients, but our citizens really. We're working proactively and not reactively, yeah. uh, which is a way I'd like to see things switch uh, with the whole healthcare system. Um, much of our work is going unseen because we're keeping people out of your hospital systems, right? right. Um, we play a critical role in keeping Medicaid patients home. Um, I have approximately five that are on Choices for Care, uh, and I have one woman I kept home for two and a half years at a wheelchair level with an advanced dementia. Um, and I figured I'm saving, based on Vermont Medicaid rates from this spring, um, $11,500 a month per Medicaid client. Um, we are preventing the hospital visits. We're coordinating the primary cares and coordinating telehealth visits. In some cases, going out with my iPad or my cell phone and facilitating those visits. Um, and we're globally addressing social determinants of health. Yep. Um, sorry, notes here. Um, the big piece of it is we have the time and the luxury. We're not limited by insurances, so they trust me. I've been the coordinator for two and a half years and on the board prior to that. So I've seen these folks pretty much weekly for two and a half years. Um, we've established relationships with key community partners, including Gifford, which we have an MOU with. Um, and we're a real linchpin for continuity of care, right? So I got the client that goes to the hospital, I follow them at the hospital. Now they're going to rehab, I follow them there. And I'm advocating, facilitating the whole time to get them home. Um, I'd like to thank Sora Rescue too. South Royalton Rescue is another one of our MOUs. And they also, um, I f work with them, particularly with Becky, um, around the home visits, which need boosting. They're not being utilized these, um, th through, through Gifford. Um, so just again, here we are, we're, we're soliciting private citizen donations. So the citizens are again paying for these services. Uh, we're also doing um, grant writing. I'm 13 years into this profession as an OT and I'm, um, you know, I'm being paid entry level position with no benefits. So I'm, you know, that needs to change if we're gonna keep quality professionals. Um, I think I think that's a big piece of it. You know, there's Bill H358 is sitting in the House right now. That's a good start. It needs to address the role of community care coordinators and not just nurses. Um, as you suggested, there's a significant nursing shortage, no. um, and they're, they cannot use their skills in this role at the time. They cannot provide skilled care. So I'd love to see the expansion of that language, and to you know, it's limited right now to five years. Um, and the priority focus is going on new programming, not supporting the, the programs already in place, um, which we need that support. Um, so my question for you is, how do you plan to connect Blueprint for Health and the larger hospital systems with the community care coordinators? Thank you. Well, the answer is very important and hopefully more embedded in all the primary care sites and some of the specialty sites. I mean, I, what you've identified and do is what needs to be done a lot more. And I think one of the questions is what level of medical knowledge is needed to do that, right? My, and my, my familiarity is more with RN case managers doing medical things. Um, and, and often they have a, an associated social worker because those problems come together. But it's been important to have them embedded in primary care so that they meet the patient and the patient answers the telephone when somebody calls. 
But no, very important. I think part of this effort will be f to, to f in part, figure out whether everybody needs to be a, a full-fledged medical professional, whether it's an occupational therapist, you know, nurse, whatever. And that may not be the case uh, unless you're actually doing what some of the folks that, that I helped set up did, which was take a, have a rescue kit for a patient with asthma or a patient with a COPD or a patient with CHF, that when that patient hit certain parameters, weight gain, whatever, they could call under the orders of the doc and say, start taking your diuretic and then come see us. Uh, but no, you're right. And it's this coordination of what is, I would characterize as an under, it, it's not, we don't have a system. Nobody designed it, okay? And I think that's going to be part of the challenge for Vermont is you have an opportunity to design something and you have a lot of the right pieces. But you will have to make, I think, some allocation decisions about what prioritizes over something else. But again, as I commented, there's $6.4 billion out there. And there's surely some part of that that can be uh, reallocated. Okay, but it will need a group decision. It will need, uh, you know, folks to work together. But what you're doing is what needs to happen. And it's one of the things that, you know, the state has helped to support and that we're emphasizing in our, here, please use this. Oh, that, that doesn't work. All right. I won't use this. Yeah, please. You're I, I won't go on um, too much, but it's a great point. Um, this is very much sort of gets back, I'm sorry, again, Brendan Krauss, uh, new director of health care reform, day 12. Um, this, <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're on the same page with you, there have been, my understanding, um, you know, a number of very successful uh, initiatives that share very similar goals, but maybe have slightly different um, audiences or um, maybe funding mechanisms, but that really align and really should be brought together. And that's very much something we're going to be looking at doing um, in the next phase of this work. Great. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments? Uh, we are a little after. Yes, ma'am, please. Why don't you take her to this? Uh, uh, you're going to have to run a little, but I think it doesn't There you go. Hi, for those that don't know me, I do work at Gifford, but I'm also the president of the Vermont Nurse Practitioners Association. And I am wearing my VNPA hat at the moment. I want to be clear about that. But I have heard a ton of physician-centric language throughout these presentations across the state. There is a huge workforce that I feel is being not incorporated into this, being the nurse practitioners and the physician assistants around the state that work very hard to do primary care across the state. We are not reimbursed at the same level as a physician, but we give the same level of care as a physician. So I think it's really important as we start looking at this, looking at the AHEAD model, when we start looking at the AHEAD model and the waivers that we need to ask for from Medicare, that we need to model after the Maryland AHEAD model, or I'm sorry, the Maryland managed care model, as well as there's a couple other waivers that we need to address so that we can provide quality care for the citizens. We also provide it, unfortunately, at a little bit cheaper of a level for the citizens so our care can go a little bit further. I also want to say that we are not allowing nurses, registered nurses, to practice at the fullest of their education either. We hamper them with old rules or rules that get made in legislature without talking to people with their feet on the ground. Similarly, we do this with our MAs in the offices. There is no reason that a registered nurse with their education can't follow an algorithm and do something that has been approved by a physician, but we have rules in our current legislature that prohibit that. And we need to address these things. Absolutely. We need some examples because we need, I agree. And, and by the way, I was married to a nurse practitioner. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you.
Hello. Um, I don't work in healthcare, and as I look around this room, I think I'm probably sharing a lot of what people already know. My name is Lisa Manning Floyd. I'm a Central Vermont resident, and I'm a principal at Randolph Union High School. I felt compelled to join you all this evening to speak to the idea that consolidation of resources is a positive path forward to create sustainable health care in Vermont. Although consolidation is one path forward, it should not be considered the only path because while it may work well from a cost perspective, it, it ignores the needs of our rural communities and the needs of families who experience or who work hard, experience poverty, sorry, or who work hard to financially survive just above the poverty line. I want to be clear that our small rural facilities allow families access to birthing centers, primary care physicians, and mental health services, as well as substance use treatment close to home. These are vital resources in our communities. Many families do not have easy access to transportation to appointments. This is underscored by the fact that the school that I lead has a Gifford nurse practitioner, practitioner embedded within our school three days a week. Her services are utilized fully by our families, and her schedule is, it's just packed. She's there three days a week, and we struggle to get people in, and we try to help kids not miss their appointments. This is underscore, okay, I already said that. <laughs> we as a community have worked to ensure that our students have access to dental care, again, affiliated with Gifford, and medical care through our schools. It's important because families without stable transportation, who may be work, where parents may be working more than one job to make ends meet, may not be able to access care on the traditional schedule in a doctor's office. Gifford is also a partner in education locally. In previous years, our high school has partnered with Nolato, formerly GW Plastics, and Gifford to show students how local manufacturing benefits our community. Students learned how the plastic disposable products are made for medical facilities, then would travel to Gifford, and skilled staff would show them how they're used. We've also had students engage in the medical assist program, assistant program at Gifford. Having a hospital in our community that helps us meet our students' needs by providing them with flexible pathways while at the same time providing a workforce for our community and our state. Additionally, several families, including my own, rely on Gifford for jobs that are important to our community. Over the two decades, we have seen employment opportunities in central Vermont dry up that I've worked in Randolph, I've seen them dry up. But in the past several years, we've seen these opportunities begin to open up and strengthen our local economies. Curtailing services at small rural hospitals will further harm rural communities and families. Families already struggling financially, struggling to find affordable housing, and struggling to find access to needed services. On a more per personal note, my family's received high quality care at our local hospital. My son was born at 28 weeks gestation at Gifford Medical Center, and they cared for him until he could receive transport to a neonatal intensive care unit. Members of the Gifford team reached out, checked in with us, and followed up to see how he was doing as he grew and eventually thrived. My father was cared for at Gifford after he broke a hip. It was clear that Gifford, at Gifford, he was not simply a patient to be treated, but a community member to be cared for. He looked forward to seeing familiar faces who knew him by name and did not need him to recount every painful detail of the story that led to him needing a hip replacement every time he met someone new. Eventually, he was treated at larger facilities, and one north of us and one south of us, and his experience was not the same. Hours, hours later, after his hip surgery, I was able to see him. But I wasn't initially because his patient number had somehow been lost, no one had given it to me, and neither his social, social security number or his name or any other information would get me to be able to access him. In addition to being a vital access point to care, management of our small, small rural hospitals should continue to rest with these hospitals and communities. I understand the merits of consolidation. I served on my local school board and chaired our district's consolidation committee. What we found by traveling to local communities and listening to the voices of people who live in those communities 
is that there are textured and strong local connections that provide necessary context and insight into those the needs of those communities. We found that people locally have the best understanding of how to operate in their communities. While we could work together to find efficiencies and positive solutions, we needed to understand that communities function best when people are empowered to work together and solve their own problems. Gifford is a true member of this community. The work they do through the last mile, of ri last mile ride supporting end of life care and community members facing a loss is truly a local asset. In addition, they step in to offer support in times of need to our full community. Last spring, in our, our school's physical plant failed. Um, we had a huge power failure. We were out of school for several days and 40 students were prepared to sit for AP exams, which are delivered on the college board schedule. Suddenly, we no longer had a place for them to test. Gifford stepped up and offered us conference room rooms that were perfect test environments for our students. In fact, they want to test there again next year. <laughs> this happened over the course of one afternoon and a couple of phone calls. I do not believe that a larger I institution could have been a community support in that way at that speed. Nearly half of the students who sat for those exams earned scores high enough for them to be exempt from the same classes at the college level. 18 students total were able to complete work they had engaged in all year through the generous support of our community hospital. Gifford supports our family and communities in a myriad of ways that go beyond providing high quality health care. I appreciate you taking the time to engage in this process. I hope that you will more thoroughly engage communities to look for com locally based solutions to the challenges that we face as you seek solutions to the more global issues related to access, such as affordable insurance, including prescription plans, access to affordable housing for qualified staff, and greater, greater mental health resources. Thank you. Hey, yeah, Dave Merman again from the Green Mountain Care Board. I just want to thank you so much for that comment. And, I, and actually, if you would submit that so everybody else can read it, that would be wonderful. This is not about consolidation, not about closing hospitals. Consolidation, unfortunately, in healthcare, the data doesn't look that great for cost savings. So this is about engaging communities and trying to work with communities to try to figure out how we can, all the communities in Vermont and as a state, we can solve these, these problems because we don't want hospitals to close and we don't want to lose that independent control where you get that responsiveness that you're talking about. So anyways, I just, I really appreciate the comment, very touched by it, but I, thank you. My name is Vic Roboto. I'm the chairman of the board of Gifford Medical Center. And I have a couple of comments and a question. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank the legislature and the Green Mountain Care Board and AHS and Dr. Hamry and your team this is a really, really complicated, <laughs> difficult, and important and urgent problem. So appreciate your leadership in bringing this to the fore and taking the initiative statewide and here uh, in our community to uh, bring us to here today and, and to help us go forward in a positive way. We are all in this together. I mean, it's, it's Gifford, it's all the other hospitals, it's all the community-based agencies like Clara Martin Center, <laughs> and the others, the schools, we are all in this together. So there's no us and them in this process. It really has to be, we are all in it together. We are all partners in this process. Um, now, my question, uh, could you turn to slide 15, please? I have a question for, probably for Dr. Merman. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Merman, could you talk about the sort of the policy intention of uh, reimbursement expectation below the cost of care? Because you know it's a hospital or a hardware store. You don't stay in business very long <laughs> if the, if uh, expenses are outgrowing the rate of increase of revenue. So, I just yeah. put that to you. It's a. Uh, 
it's definitely a hard question to answer. I think generally speaking, we have set goals as a state to increase the that of increase of total cost of health care benchmarked based upon um, various economic factors. And I can't remember what led to the 3.5 to 4.3 of the all payer model. It's the CPI. That was CPI, and this is CPI plus one. Um, if you go to one or two more slides, but go to the, yeah. it will go. Uh, no, yeah, there's one where you have all the, this one here. We have this disturbing trend where you go from like 23, sorry, 13 to 22, where it goes up by, um, uh, I did the math on this, like 4% per year. And then 23 and 24, we're going up by 10% per year. The intention in the all pair model was to sort of take, starting at 2019, was to go to 3.5 to 4.3 for total all payer spending. And that clearly has gotten way out of control. So I think the 3.5 goal is somewhat reflective, granted also looking at sort of other states who are trying to control this incredible high cost growth in healthcare and what people can afford from insurance. But that's the goal. But it does create, I mean, it. this is, this is the, the challenge of this, is how can you work with um, what the state can afford and lead to hospitals that have sustainable margins um, I'm optimistic, some things, one, one thing I want to, yeah, one thing I would in, in do that too is there are some costs that seem to be improving, which is like traveling nursing, so that could have a significant impact on that, but I guess I'm going to pass to Bruce here. Before you pass to Bruce, could you go back to the age demographic slide, because when we talk about cost changes, the demographic changes of age in the state are going to affect that drastically, which is what we're seeing. No, you're, you're both right, okay? But part of this issue is that as those premiums go up, people stop buying health insurance, right? Small business owner can't afford it. You, people decide they're going to take their chances, which means they go to the hospital and say, I can't pay, I need a payment plan, or it's free care. So it, it doesn't make it better. And I think the thing I was trying to point out with this is that the, the best place you can do care is not in a hospital, right? I mean, I, I ran infection control and quality improvement programs in hospitals for 20 years. Hospitals, even though they're, they're well run and they do the best they can, are not safe places to be, okay? And your food's better and your bed's softer at home. So the end state of population health, which is the path Vermont set its feet on, is that hospitals shrink and care in the community and at home grows. And that's what helps deal with these, with these trends. Because unaltered, I mean, you're, you're exactly right. If, if nothing's done and you have to constrain costs at something, Right, because the constraint at the end of the day is what you all and I can pay. And so that to me is the fundamental issue. And, and the, the, you're right, right? The economics for the hospital and everybody else are not good. They're gonna get worse, okay? And I know Dan and team and the board are working hard at other ways to do this. A lot of the things you hear about the, uh, the association with the primary care and the work with the community organizations and the care coordination and those kinds of things are the sorts of things that you need to really proceed on. Now, that may change the shape of some hospitals, right? Right now, for most hospitals, and I don't know Dan would have to comment, but for many hospitals, half of their income comes from what they do outpatient. Most surgery is done outpatient. I had a hip replacement. I was in the OR at 6 a.m. and home at 5. Okay, it's outpatient stuff. I mean, stuff that, you know, when I trained uh, 50 years ago, you'd have been in the hospital for two weeks, and then it would have taken you three months 
of physical therapy to recover the muscle mass that you lost because you were flat on your back in bed. So, you know, so I, I think there is opportunity. And, the, you know, the hospital may change from a place that does a lot of inpatient care to a place that does a lot of outpatient care. And you can do that, I think, in a way where people still have jobs, care is still available in the community. I mean, you know, you've already made, I think, the right choice that nobody does heart surgery or neurosurgery except the two big places, right? Because as I said, there are some things that need teams and equipment. And there's data now that it's not just the surgeon. I, I've got papers that say, gee, the anesthesiologist who takes care of that patient in the OR, if they don't have the right level of experience, the patient does worse. So, I, I, but I think in a community process, with guidance from people who are experts in, in various things, you can work this out. But I, you know, but I think what you have to keep coming back to is for the country and for the state and for the community and for the individual, all these, all these um, cost trends are going the wrong way. And so there, you know, there are other things. Um, you know, I'm about to turn 77. I've got a living will. I've talked to my family about what I don't want to have happen, right? And so if you've not done that or the community doesn't have a program to do that, and I know I've talked to some care coordinators and some primary care folks who say, I spend a lot of time with that. Well, I can tell you that La Crosse, Wisconsin, 20 years ago, set up a community effort led by the ministers and others to have some of those conversations with people. So, because end of life care, the last 18 months, sometimes accounts for 80% of the total Medicare medical spend for a, a person over their lifetime. So, you know, some trivial examples, right? But there's a, a vast array of things that can be done to relieve some of the cost burden, but make the care still available that you need. And, you know, we're not like, well, I've started all my talks with folks by saying, I'm not here to close hospitals, right? What I worry about is the bank will close the hospital. And so the effort is to get the, these things done, number one, so that doesn't happen, or in the bad chance that it were to happen somewhere, there's a safety net, there, there's a way to handle that care, and the people at the hospital still have jobs. They may be doing slightly different things. But I think hospitals, Dan and crew are working on this, hospitals are coming together around the state to do things together that in the past they would have had to join a large system like Dartmouth or UVM or Geisinger or somebody to do. And again, those are options. So I, I agree with your point, sir, and yours. Um, I do think there is a way forward for you but not five years. Other questions, comments? Okay, yes, and we'll take two more, and then I'll stay, and if you want to talk, happy to do that, but I'm sure it's, uh, we're getting close to. Hi, my name is Bridget. I'm a nurse practitioner. I work here at Gifford. Um, I love primary care. I think it's excellent. It's a really great solution. It keeps people out of the hospital. It's what I do every day. And so my question for you is, you talk about primary care in the presentation, but I'm wondering if you have any sort of tangible recommendations about how we can increase affordable access to primary care and how we can help support primary care providers so that we can see an appropriate number of patients and see them safely with well-trained staff to help us. I do. But yes, there's a list. And staff and computer stuff and 
salary support, family nursing things. Uh, yeah, many things. I mean, we've uh, done that elsewhere and been able to um, get people in within 24 hours to their provider for a, an urgent call, three days for a return visit, that kind of thing. So answer is yes. It's a very important foundational element. And so there's a lot of detail. This, If we you want to talk primary care, we can go two hours. If you want to talk about all this, we can go two days. And the task I've got is trying to put this in a bunch of slides for the Green Mountain Care Board that can be read it, you know, understood and not require me there to talk about it all the time. But thank you for your comments. You're right on, and yes. Dr. Hammer, it's the report that you'll be releasing. Oh, yeah, yeah, let, let me come, let, let me just finish the, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Um, where we go from here, you are the eighth community group that I've spoken to. So we've, we've done a process over the last 12 months of getting input from you all and other physicians and the folks I listed, uh, taking the data, taking the comments, getting a picture of what's going on and pro projecting forward what it would happen if nothing changed. Okay, and that's all the bad stuff. We're now, we've taken a, a set of initial thoughts to the hospitals and boards in more detail than this. It, shown them this, shown them the financial projection, and but a bunch of other things as well. Talked about some options. The hospital folks said, well, that one looks okay. No, we don't think that one goes our way and so forth. And we've amended those. We're now getting your feedback on this. We'll take all of this together, relook at some of the data, and the new stuff's come out in the last six months. I mean, there are other, uh, uh, articles and other data points about what happens if OB disappears and that kind of thing. Take all that. We are in the process now of putting together a final set of recommendations and options, which will go into a report to the Green Mountain Care Board this fall. And obviously, we have a steering committee that has Agency of Human Services people on it and Green Mountain people on it, and, uh, and, and so they oversee our work. But we'll have a final report that will be presented to the Green Mountain Care Board in the fall. Uh, legislators, you know, we've been talking to as well, and I'm sure at some point after the Green Mountain Care Board gets it, it'll go to the legislature. We will have recommendations in there for uh, the Green Mountain Care Board, for various parts of the Agency of Human Services, for the legislature, which is one of the reasons I want to talk to that lady up there about the uh, nursing uh, things and others, because some of these deal very specifically with things that need to be addressed. And so for housing, when you look at the root cause analysis, what causes this, what causes this, the end game of that is zoning and environmental regulations, right? That's what takes somebody four or five years to get housing approved. That's got to change because the fix to a lot of this stuff is people have to have a place to go when they're finished their mental health treatment and need support or, or they need to get care at home. So, so the answer is yes, there's, a, there's still some to do. I, I would say we're 90% of the way through. But your comments and those of others in the room and the data, I, you know, we keep finding people in these meetings that have information or specific examples, which is what I need because I need to be able to say to the Green Mountain Care Board and the legislature and whoever, here's a problem that despite a lot of work, maybe people haven't thought about or whatever, but you could plan better for. And here's a set of problems about how you get more uh, physicians into Vermont. So for example, only 11% of physicians in Vermont were trained outside the U.S. The national average is 22 percent. So why is that? I, I don't know. Okay, 
But I, I think the, the point is that there's data in various places that would point you in a number of directions about issues that can be addressed um, and solved and would help uh, deal with some of the problems that, uh, that you're experiencing. We had another comment over here, I think. And then the last one, because it's 8 o'clock, and if you, need to, if you need to get home, i got to check the weather app and see if it stopped raining outside. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your comments. And again, if you have anything you think about later, Put it on the website.